So, so as you can see there, there's plenty of information parameters, information to help you set the high performance. Now we're going to have a look at some of the peripherals that we have on board the STM32 L4 device. So we'll start with connectivity. So the STM32 L4, despite being low power, we've already shown you it's high performance. There is a lot of connectivity in this device. So we have up to six UARTs uh, available on the larger pin count uh, variants of this family, uh, where you can get up to 10 megabits per second of data transfer. They're fully flexible, so you can configure the data bits, parity, if you want to use synchronous mode. Oops, my slide seems to be unautomated there. Um, and they can also do auto board rate detection. The UARTs are also multifunction, so we can do ERDA, Smart Card, LIN, RS232, 485, with and without flow control. So the UARTs are very, very flexible peripherals on the STM32 L4. The I2C, we have three of those um, on the family. They now support the new FASMO Plus, so the one megabit per second. Um, data rate. Again, just as the UARTs, they are multifunctional or multi configurable. So you can be master slave, <clears throat> different address modes. The ability to do clock stretching as well is supported in the I squared C's. And we also have the ability to support SM bus 2.0 and PM bus 1.1 on the I squared C peripheral. So the hardware is there to support these extra protocols that use that type of format. We have three SPIs on board the family of devices. These can go up to 40 megahertz. And again, just as the other ones, they're fully configurable. So master slave, full duplex, half duplex, uh, two wire interface, support the two standards of Motorola and TI. And they've also got RX and TX FIFOs inside the SPIs. The USB is available as a USB 2.0 full speed device uh, and we all support OTG 2.0 spec on the device as well. So the USB can be host or slave. Uh, we've got the new features of link power management integrated into the USB cell now and battery charger detection built in there. This particular USB on the STM32 L4 is classed as a crystalless USB so you can run the device without the crystal uh, and it resyncs at every start of frame so the 48 megahertz MSI is capable of generating an, an exact frequency so that we can do each individual frame and then it resyncs at the new start of frame of every USB so if you need to use USB but don't want an external crystal then we can manage it with the hardware we have in the STM32L4. We have one CAN cell inside the STM32L4, up to one megabits per second. And again, just like all the other communication peripherals, it's flexible. Um, it's got the FIFOs, um, three stages, it's got all the filter banks that you'd expect to have in there. And again, like the USB, it can work without the external crystal thanks to the 1% HSI that we have inside the STM32. And finally, we have the SD card, uh, MMC card interface. So this will support three different card protocols there, secure digital, multimedia card, and SD uh, cards. And any of these other modules that use that type of interface, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, some of the cameras and memory modules, can also be mapped onto this particular peripheral of the STM32 L4. So some of the newer features that have been added to the STM32 L4, we have SWPMI, so this is Serial Wire Protocol Master Interface, uh, primarily used for smart card. So, so we have that feature available inside the device now. We have 
audio. So we have two SAI, so serial audio interfaces uh, that can manage up to CD quality um, data rates. And we've got um, protocol support for AC97, SPDIF, things like that inside the peripheral as well. Uh, we have a dedicated infrared uh, timer. So this uses uh, two of the timers there, timer 16 and 17, and supports all the infrared protocols, so RC5, RC6, RCA, uh, and can deliver the correct current output to drive the infrared LEDs if you need them in the system. And we have one new peripheral, the DFSDM, uh, which we'll cover later on when we get to the new peripherals uh, section just after lunch. So that was the connectivity. So now if we look at the analog functionality that we have inside the SDM32, I'll start in the top right hand corner. So, so we have a temperature sensor. So this is same as we had in all the other STM32s. It's wired into one of the channels of ADC number one uh, and provides you with the temperature sensor, temperature sensing of the silicon itself. So remember it's embedded inside the chip. It's not got any external connections. So it's inside the plastic packaging. So it will give you the temperature of the silicon itself. We have up to three ADCs uh, inside the device. Uh, these can go up to five mega samples per second. They're 12 bit SARs, and we've got the ability to do oversampling. So, with the oversampling unit, we can get up to a 16 bit resolution out of the 12 bit ADC. These ADCs can also be run in low power mode. So as we keep saying, it's a high performance device, but it is still an STM32L, so which is a low power device. So we can get them down to one mega sample per second. We can get down to 200 microamps approximately. Also built into the ADCs are the analog watchdogs. So you've got the ability to have an analog watchdog per ADC channel. So you can just set a maximum and minimum threshold for a, an ADC signal that you're monitoring. Don't care about the reading as long as it's not outside of your watchdog window for the ADC. We've got two op amps on board this device. So these are rail to rail op amps and again, they can work in normal mode, which is when you need the performance and the speed, or you can configure them to work in low power mode where they're down at about 45 microamps. So they're very flexible op amps. All the pins can be bonded to external um, GPIO pins so that you can connect the inputs and the outputs to whatever you need in your application. We have two DACs on board the device, uh, up to 12-bit resolution. Um, they've got buffered outputs, uh, and again, they can the pins can be bonded to the outside world, so you can connect them to what you need to uh, plug into uh, with noise and triangular wave generation integrated inside the cell. We have the VBAT pin on the device. Uh, this can be used to supply the device when mains power disappears. Uh, it's an automatic switch over to VBAT so that you don't have to um, drain the battery when there's main power available to the system. So the battery gets isolated at that point. And we now have a battery management pin, which is wired into ADC number three, so that you can actually monitor using the ADC of the device the current voltage level on your battery. So there's a way of managing the uh, system to say, we need to signal that there is a, the battery running flat, we need to be serviced. We have the VREF input pin. 
So this is uh, on the larger pin counts, an external pin, so that you can actually set a dedicated uh, VREF value for all the analog components uh, inside the device. And we also have the internal VREF, which is again, like all STM32s, connected to one of the channels of the ADC, so that you have a permanent internal reference inside the device. And finally, we have two comparators. Uh, comparator number one, comparator number two. Both of these comparators have all their pins bonded to external GPIO pins. So again, you can use them within your application as you need to. They can work in two modes. Standard mode, uh, where you're using the performance of the device, you want faster uh, comparators to work to do various things or you can run them in low power mode where you can get down to about 400 nanoamps on the comparators. Next section is the control logic. Uh, this covers all the various components that you will need for running the system. So we have up to 14 timers available inside the STM32L4. Uh, 11 16-bit, 2 32-bit, two low power timers. So these low power timers are dedicated to work in all the low power modes of the STM32L4. And they can also be clocked from external sources as well. So you can put the device into full stop mode where all the clocks have switched off and this timer is receiving its pulse from an encoder, for instance. We've also got enough catch compares with complementary outputs so we can drive motors. So, so there's a full motor control um, timer on board this device as well. The RTC on board this device is 300 nanoamps. Uh, it's full calendar. Uh, it supports multiple alarms, periodic wake-up timers. There's free tamper pins now uh, available on this device. And there's ways of doing the calibration to make sure that you're very accurate in your timing of this device. Then we have the LCD segment display. So we can generate up to 176 segments at 44 by four or 320 segments at 40 by eight. And we've got all the flexibility to control the various duty cycles and biasings, depending on what type of um, segment display we have connected on the outside world. There is an internal step up available inside the device. Again, you can use it, you don't have to use it. So it is configurable. And this can help with uh, some of the power consumption of the device if you use the internal and not use the internal. And finally, we have the capacitive touch sensing. So we can do up to 24 channels split across eight groups. Uh, these use one capacitor for three channels uh, and can generate um, quite a lot of dedicated touch, capacitive touch pads uh, that you can need for various types of applications. So depending on what you're doing within the application, we have the ability to do it. Um, the charge transfer uh, extra analog components are built into the GPIO pins of these particular pads that can be set up for touch. The power supply network for the STM32L4, it's 1.7 volts to 3.6 volts for the main VDD lines. USB needs at least 3.0 volts uh, to run. So we have a dedicated VDD USB uh, power supply pin. So you might want to run the device down at 1.8 volts, but still have USB available. So you can have um, a dedicated VDD for USB um, connected to the device. Most of the GPIO pins are five volt tolerant. So they can receive the five volts um, inbound to the device without causing any damage. Uh, if you want to drive five volts, then you will need external transistors uh, to do that. We have a dedicated VLCD pin so that we can drive the um, 
internal, external uh, elements of the seven segment display. The VBAT pin we've already mentioned earlier on. And we've got dedicated analog pins. So we have a VSSA, VDDA. Normally these will be connected via RCs and inductors to the VDD line to provide, remove noise from the analog components. If you want to connect them to very precise external analog signals, you can do in this um, environment. And we now have the ability, as you can see there flashing, we have the ability to charge the battery now through the system. So it's a new feature that we've added in the STM32L4 that's different to all other STM32s. There is now a charging feature for the battery pin.